ultimately, self-storage is a rental transaction. It's a real estate transaction, and it is a commercial real estate transaction. And two, your customers still do the same thing that they have always done, which is put stuff in and take stuff out of spaces. So the core business hasn't changed a great deal, and the law governing self-storage is not all that innovative. (laughs) And those are some things you might want to keep in mind. Uh, I want to tell, you know, John said, uh, my, said I had some thought, I might have some reservations about security. He forgets that before I was, uh, I started working with the Self Storage Association, I spent 15 years in insurance. So we like security and we like things like that. Uh, and I really do like the idea of emphasizing the self in self storage. Uh, I do want to talk about just uh, briefly the first meeting I went to in self-storage because the technology question and the security question were paramount because this was all the buzz and it was for several years. This goes back to 1980 and the big question back then was, does anybody know to fence or not to fence? That was the question. And there were a lot of operators that did not want to have fences because they felt that if they did, they'd become bailees. And they would be liable for the break-ins at their facility. Um, Fortunately, people really concluded that it was probably better not to have break-ins in the first place than to have a lot of break-ins and not be liable for them. And that thinking uh, finally by the late 80s was gone. But those were the kind of questions that happened in the early days of the industry. And the technology that we're looking at now is making some real revolutions in the, you know, the, the relationship between obviously the operator and the uh, and the uh, customer and one of those big ones is oops did i get it okay let's see my oh i probably have it wrong oh there we go so the question is do you wrap And the reason I bring this up is that this is the fundamental uh, question around the contracting process. Uh, How you get agreement out of your customers, how you make agreements with your customers. And uh, within the sort of the legal community, there 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 are four types of wrapping. Uh, We have browse wrap, sign in wrap, which is really a variation on the browse theme, scroll wrap, and click wrap. And all of these are useful there. Some of them are more useful for certain things than others. And But this idea that you can elicit agreement, you can get your customer to agree to things, including a rental agreement, is something that is uh, actually quite uh, accepted generally within the legal community. And so we're going to take a look at click wrap because this is probably the most common way that people contract online. It's the way you buy an airline ticket. And when you buy an airline ticket, you agree to, uh, it's rather arcane, but it's the uh, carriage of service agreement. And carriage goes back to middle, medieval times. Uh, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting development that so many contracts are being done in this way. Uh, and uh, oftentimes the contract actually does not appear during the contracting process. But what must appear, and this is sort of key to all of these types of uh, uh, ways of contracting, is that uh, the customer has the opportunity our attention is drawn to uh, the, you know, a, a contract that they might be agreeing to. But when they hit that button, I agree. Or in the case of scroll wrap, they scroll down a, ro- a document and hit I agree or I accept or something like that. That's a binding contract. And no longer are we, and it has all of the force and effect of a wet signature, just like doing that on paper. And these agreements are being enforced every day. And interestingly enough, uh, 
plaintiffs who are suing because they are usually had something happen and there is a provision of the contract they may not like use exactly the same defenses or the same assertions that they used when paper contracts very common was i never read the agreement and judges on paper contracts would say but you signed the contract and if you sign the contract you're bound by its terms and conditions the same is true with electronic contracts and again the uh uh the click wrap contract contract uh doing contracts in a click wrap format is ubiquitous and generally enforceable realize that there are uh judges plaintiffs attorneys all have tools to try to sidestep uh, unpleasant provisions of contract but that hasn't really changed as long as you do your click wrap right it will most likely your rental agreement will most likely be enforced if you do your click wrap right your terms of use of your website will be enforced and those are think about this too now you got a website you're not just dealing with a single agreement with your customers everybody that moves through that website is saying that i agree to the terms of use the other thing those who rent also deal with a rental agreement now one thing the contracting process has changed and that is because you're becoming somewhat more dependent on software vendors to get that who who do it right and so that's really something that you need to think about when you engage in the contract uh for services on doing your online contracting is my vendor doing this right and from a legal standpoint what's right is really the ability to prove can you extract or what do you have access to or can your vendor extract data that proves that at such and such a date on such and such a time that this person clicked i accept and that they were fully aware that they were entering into a rental agreement of a particular self storage space and if you can't access some of this uh data behind the scenes you may not be able to prove that a contract was entered into that is becoming less of a problem if you look at some of the early uh self uh, not self storage but sort of online contracting uh contracts uh the ability to come forth with adequate proof that a particular client had actually assented could be a problem for the uh for, you know for the business that was asserting that a contract in some way um you know protected them from liability gave them the right to have claims uh, arbitrated something of that nature so this is really the two things with respect to click wrap that is really important in that you uh you pick the right vendor but also you are able to when you need it extract uh proof and that this information is available you know the same length of time probably 5 6 7 years uh cuz people uh people leave and come back and bring claims doesn't happen often but you want to have your data available if you need it the ability to prove that they were that a particular agreement was executed at a particular time well mainly date but time is also a valuable since it's going to probably be done be done automatically and uh and one thing that you might want to make sure you will have access to is the way that that screen looked when let's just say from january of 2024 to uh december of 26 this is the way our interface screen with our customer looked is that available can the judge see what the uh what the tenant saw so just realize that there are some things that you have to do that are differently but in a lot of ways we're 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 going to the 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 uh you know the the way the suits are brought the way that they try to sidestep your re- your release of liability um and uh, or your limitation of value they're going you know they uh, there's not a lot of innovation going on in that area it's the same arguments with maybe packaged a little bit differently that for some 
some reason, oh, I never knew what I was doing when I, when I clicked that. Well, in the final analysis, it doesn't matter. You are on notice. The customer is on notice that there is an underlying contract here. If you're using click wrap, they are looking at the contract if they are using what we call the scroll wrap type of methodology. And I want to tell you two things. Click wrap and scroll wrap are the only two methods that you should probably use uh, for your rental agreement and con and consent to your terms of use. And the reason for that is these are pretty reliable contracting methods. Um, browse wrap, sign in wrap, which is kind of a misnomer in some ways, uh, not so much. But let's take a look. Um, so just keep on sign in and browse wrap. I think can be used for certain things, not so much for contracts, uh, rental agreement again, terms of use agreement again. But if you're trying to give a tenant notice about something, uh, browse wrap is probably okay. And we're going to look at an example of exactly where something like uh, and the difference between browse wrap and um, and, and, and sign in wrap is. Something will often pop up on the screen, and in Browse Wrap, if you continue to use the, you know, to navigate through the website, you're, you're, we're going to assume your consent. And with uh, uh, sign in wrap, you click yes. But there's not a specific, you know, uh, it's not the same formality as you deal with uh, in, a, in a contract sense. So just just be aware of this because as we're going to see. Um, there's some litigation running around uh, when you contract online and do things online. Um, the next thing I want to get into is pricing and rent increases and sort of interesting. I was unaware that the uh, speaker this morning was going to go into such detail about pricing. And this is an area uh, not so much of how prices are set but more about how uh, price, pricing is advertised. Uh, and b both the federal and state governments have been looking into this. The FTC is looking into this. And it's an area of some, uh, there's, a, there's tension here. Let's just put it that way. And I think uh, most of you may know why. Because if you've ever rented a hotel room, and you go online, it's $139 a night until you actually get to the cost. And then there's a resort fee added. And it, it and it's a per night fee, and it applies to everybody. Well, why isn't that incorporated, simply cor incorporated into the rate? And we know that it was a, somebody had the great idea that if I did it that way, I could show lower prices for my hotel rooms. Uh, the other area of pricing that's bothering uh, the, uh, the the powers that be is um, what we call drip pricing, and and, and it's a it, it's a little uh, kind of an odd thing because it's where you start to sort of like peeling an onion, where uh, you have a, a base price and then you have add-ins, and the airlines are probably the most. Uh, you know, who do this the most because there's a seat, seat selection fee. There's a baggage fee. There's a cancellation fee. And it goes on and on where as you go through the process, you just get one fee after another in order to, uh, but, but before you actually get to the final click and you buy your ticket anymore. And uh, for you, you, you kind of think congressmen and women fly around a lot because they're going back to their constituencies, and so they're very cognizant of that. And it's one of those areas that, again, uh, the Fed, federal government is looking at. Congress is not happy with with drip pricing models and things like that. It's probably not a big problem in self storage. Um, the only, you know, the 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 big uh, surprise might be is the admin fee that's sort of automatic, but it's a one-time only fee. 
So it may be, you know, it doesn't really directly affect the rent on multiple, if you're renting for multiple months, so it's uh, less likely. Um, another might be uh, insurance protection plan, especially if you're you're getting 85% participation. Uh, most of this, I think, though, can be handled with uh, disclosure asterisks. You know, you have, an, you have the price and an asterisk and just simply say administration fees may apply, uh, you know, insurance may be required, something like that. I don't think it has to be in great detail. But I think, uh, but just be aware that these are things that are upsetting our, 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 our the uh, some of the folks in Congress uh, with respect to pricing models and uh, the the FCC, the FTC is way, waving in. And and in fact, the uh, hotels have been sued over their resort fee. And I and I think that even the FTC has brought an action against some of the chains on that. So that's the one where you segment mandatory fees that are going to apply to every single customer, and you essentially are using it to be able to post a lower rate on your website. Which brings us, to, I think, to some extent to the uh, to the interesting the question about. Um, uh, 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 the charges for uh, credit cards, and uh, and the reason that's industry, you know, incorporated into your rent, or do you actually want to have a charge for it? Interestingly enough, the state of New York recently passed a law with respect to that. Well, they revised the law. Their original law with respect to uh, credit card charges uh, was um, bounced because the uh, U.S. Supreme Court said this was an illegal infringement of speech. And there were about 10 states, including California and New York, that uh, you, you uh, said you could tell people the cash price of something, but you couldn't tell them that there was a processing fee. And you might be able to figure out who who would be behind a statute like that, and yes, it was the credit card companies. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that seemed to be swept away. But New York now has a, a, a statute that requires uh, you to actually post the full and complete price of something that you're paying for with a credit card. So you might have dual, pri- you know, pricing like 1995 or whatever. And then if you bump it up, you're going to show the total price, including the fee. So uh, it, it, it's 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 interesting stuff, but uh, it, it, I think now it's more of a trap for an unwary uh, for the unwary. And right now, the only state that's doing that is is New York for whatever reason. Uh, it may be because it's the home of uh, you know Chase and some other large banks that like this. Anyway, keep in mind that how you advertise can have an impact. And uh, and especially your fees. And if you think I can, uh, you know, you can c- kind of create a, uh, uh, you know, some kind of fee to, uh, to be uh, to added to the rent and show lower prices on the Internet, think again, because it's a practice that is clearly, um, f- let's just say at the moment, frowned upon. And there's a good chance that in the, uh, in the future that it might become illegal. Uh, this is something of a new uh, concept. We've talked about this a bit, or at least Travis has talked about it in his article. Or, and uh, we're uh, seeing the impact of uh, tenant moves in, and within 60 or 90 days, there's a rent increase. And the starting point is with real estate is a self-storage rental is a month-to-month tenancy. The law says that you can you can raise a month-to-month tenancy on 30 days notice, written notice. You're not in the residential area, so the residential laws and things like that don't apply to self-storage, and you have the legal right to do so. So, you know, what's the problem? And um, I think the problem is uh, kind of twofold. Uh, it works, as Travis's article one of his articles demonstrated in terms of uh, enhancing revenue. But on the other hand, it could be a source of friction with customers, as we've heard earlier in this thing, because nobody likes rent increases. And I think most people have it in their minds uh, that 
uh, if I rent something, I'm not going to get a rental increase, and it varies, at least for six months, maybe a year, uh, an entire year before I'm going to deal with it, because they're coming, most people are coming from the residential experience where you have more control over the rates that are charged to tenants. But anyway, and you're not governed by those things. That's one of the great things about self-storage. Uh, however, there is a possibility, and I think it's a small one, and if it were to occur, it would probably be brought against one of the larger companies because that's where the money is, and they have you know large aggregations of tenants, so you could have a fairly large class. And that is, is that at the moment the transaction is entered into, uh, the storage operator knows that they're going to send out a rent increase in 30 or 60 days. They know it in advance. It's already planned. And the tenant is uh, probably doesn't have a, a clue about that. And isn't that sort of like a bait and switch or, uh, you know, there's, there's relevant information that isn't, be, uh, isn't being disclosed? And I think there is a possibility for this kind of lawsuit within the context of some of the deceptive trade practices laws around the country and things like that. So I think it's not risk-free. The really intriguing uh, thing from the perspective of at least the largest companies in our industry is they all have um, mandatory arbitration with class action waiver, and they may think that they they have very little exposure to a uh, a class action suit if their contracting is done uh, properly. And they have a good one. And, and uh, the, the, it's a small sample size, but the instances where we have seen lawsuits brought against uh, uh, the REITs is that most of them get sent to arbitration. Uh, we don't know that that and and right now, uh, you know that that's sort of the position of the U.S. Supreme Court. The, the states are not don't like it, but they don't have a lot of choice. So it's um, it's probably a fair bet at the moment that you, that uh, most of these uh, lawsuits would be diverted to arbitration. Yet, yeah, Lance, isn't it as much as a racket as bait and switch? Huh? Isn't it as much as a racket as bait and switch? Well, you know, it's it, yeah. I, he asks, "Isn't it? A, isn't it as much a racket as bait and switch?" And I think I, I think you're you're probably accurate there. If I go into a transaction, but I have, but you know, the the thing that you always have to start with is when you enter into a month to month tenancy tenancy with me, whatever kind of landlord, you know, and especially if I'm a non residential landlord, the one of the risks that you take is I'm going to raise the rent. Well, yeah, I, 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 th- I think that it is certainly a practice that uh, the average, you know, the average renter out there would frown upon. Uh, I just, it's hard to predict where this will go, and it's hard to predict if it, you know, it, uh, nothing has been done in this area yet uh, where we've had it. And, and one of the reasons is I think uh, most of the sort of the plaintiff's bar looks at residential tenancy transactions more than they do at commercial ones. And since this comes uh, within the, the, the purview of the commercial transaction, uh, I think that it's uh, it, it just uh, it's viewed as a harder, uh, you know, sort of a harder suit to bring. But uh, no, I, I tend to agree that that w- what you're really working with, if you analyze this situation, is one per- one party comes into it with a certain uh, you know uh, with a already made decision on what will happen in a relatively short period of time, and that in- that in- that information is not being disclosed to the customer. I think one way around this is a generic. Uh, uh, warning to the tenant: You are entering into a month-to-month tenancy. Um, you know, please be aware that t- uh, you know the uh, op- owner-operator can r- raise your rent on 30 days at, uh, written notice. At least at that point, they have some warning of what could happen. So, 
Um, but the reason it's being done, obviously, is because financially it is a successful strategy, at least at the moment. The final of the three areas I wanted to talk to you about is are you wiretapping? And uh, I think most businesses are familiar with this uh, concept in the in their telephone calls with customers that come in, and we have the recording that plays. You know, we will uh, your telephone call may be uh, recorded for quality code and control purposes, etc. That kind of thing. Uh, just be aware that California and Florida, two very large self-storage uh, uh, states, Nevada, I picked them because they're nearby, uh, uh, all have what we call uh, two-party or all-party uh, consent to the recording of electronic communications. And uh, so, and then there are uh, nine other states that have uh, these rules as well. And, and Pennsylvania is an example. Um, but uh, as far as self storage, California, Texas is a one party state, so you're not necessarily going to deal with this problem there. Uh, but it's unlawful to record an electronic communication from anyone communicating with your business without their consent. So that's why we play those uh, recordings when calls come in, you know, and probably everybody that call, uses a call center or that does it uh, themselves plays this when calls are coming in. That's not where the action is. The, the, what, they are, what we're seeing are lawsuits against businesses, including self-storage, that when they go to your website, there is what we call replay software, uh, but uh, the tenant's movements through the website are recorded uh, by this software so people can kind of see where their customers or even just users are, are uh, doing uh, when they come to the website, how long they stay on a particular page, where they go from there, all of that kind of useful information that Lance talks about frequently is, uh, is re recorded and, uh, you know, used later. Um, and then the other thing that can be uh, also recorded is chat interactions. And that's a little bit more like a, uh, like a telephone call or more like a traditional thing. But, uh, so we've seen litigation over that, uh, those recordings, the recording and archiving of those movements uh, and these chat interactions. And um, so far, it hasn't been, uh, it, it's sort of been a big, a mixed bag for the plaintiff's bar. They've been losing a lot, you know, a lot of these cases are getting dismissed um, uh, by, by the courts because they really don't, they're, they're kind of wondering if uh, moving through a, uh, a website is the same as, um, you know, ch chatting on a, you know, on a, on a phone line. And so they've been less likely to do it. Where they've been a little more willing to consider it is within the chat context. Um, so just be aware that, uh, you know, we do have a class action suit against a self-storage uh, company in Florida. And uh, the, the, the movement aspect of the, uh, of the uh, allegations going through the website, that was dismissed. But the court said we're not sure if recording chat is uh, something we're going to dismiss. And so there's quite a bit of, these are the states where there's a lot of activity, California, Florida, and Pennsylvania. Um, and um, the, uh, the recording, uh, all of these lawsuits are in the early stages. Uh, you know, the only thing that's happened is, you know, the, the, they get filed, the, the defendant will file a motion dis to dismiss, and generally, sp in about half the cases, maybe a little more, they get dismissed. But in other cases, uh, they, uh, you know, the court rules, well, this seems like a plausible potential claim. We'll let it go until we start doing a little more investigation into what's going on here. Um, so I, I wouldn't panic at this stage, but there's a solution to this problem. And, you know, the solution is pretty simple. Have a pop-up on your website, you know. Uh, 
that's that, you know or a banner that comes up your movements on our website and chat conversations may be recorded for quality control purposes you know put a provision in your terms of use that you record uh, you know your uh, user user movements through the um, uh, through our website including chat conversations so uh, what I think we're going to see probably is that m- uh, most businesses will adapt the same strategy to their website as they've adopt as they have employed with respect to their uh, phone calls and you know even if uh, and, and and now that's just become you know part of the game and even people who have businesses in in uh, you know uh, uh, one party consent states they still they they all do this now it's just let people know what's going on and again I think the uh, uh, the uh, you know a, a banner and this is something where I think a browse wrap or you know or or sign in wrap whatever you want to uh, those you want to use probably works if the tenant you know continues to use the site after being given the warning and you say every time somebody comes in the warning goes up you know uh, I, I think you're probably okay and if you have it in your terms of use I think it's pretty hard to bring these claims so again it's it's one of those things I think these lawsuits are going to be a, a rather ephemeral because uh, in this instance it is relatively easy for the business community to adapt to it with respect to their uh, website development and design. But that is, uh, uh, these are just some of the areas that we've been looking at over the last year or so uh, with respect to uh, sort of um, uh, electronic uh, contracting and website use uh, that has, uh, you know, kind of had an impact, some uh, legal impact as well. But I think the thing to keep in mind is that, again, you can use this technology, um, you know, uh, and and for the most part, where it counts, the courts have been very uh, adaptable to the use of uh, sort of the electronic uh, methodologies, especially when it comes to contracting. Because, And again, I think that the uh, fact that it's just, you know, the, that cat is out of the bag and we're not going back. We're only going in one direction. It's going to become more and more common. And my guess is that the, uh, the wet signature may be uh, a very rare uh, commodity as we, uh, we, as we go forward. So we're open for questions now, and uh, and, and and it doesn't have to be to the ones we're thinking. Uh, I, um, I know that Travis had some other ideas on what we might want to talk about as well. well I'm not going to go first. <laughs> So we actually run those really expensive Ricotta cameras at all of our sites that everyone was talking about. So we capture faces, we track individuals throughout the buildings, all that kind of fun stuff. Is there any sort of liability on our end for the fact that we are tracking and recording and storing that information for people? Yeah, yeah, I could not hear the last part of that. Oh, is is what's our liability? I guess there, if we are if we're tracking people inside the facilities, we're storing images of their face. Uh, you know, you know that, that's a, that's an interesting question. And again, I think that your uh, the the liability on most of these things are you know uh, it, it can be uh, pretty much eliminated if you let people know. You know what's going on with it, with a warning sign or something like that, uh, a, a, as to what you know what what the facility is doing. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of liability. I mean, first of all, start with it's your property, and you can take uh, security measures that you deem appropriate with your property. And again, uh, there are certain statutes that have to do with video recording, but they're not nearly as um, significant as the ones for audio recording. Uh, and uh, you know, um, you know, I, I think a, 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 you know a couple of signs around the perimeter just say, you know, we have cameras or we re- we video record uh, what's happening in our facility probably meets any uh, you know uh, uh, any burden of disclosure that you have. Uh, 
uh, is a posted sign uh, as legally binding as a signed contract? The answer is no, except what it does is it, it, the reason you post signs, the reason you put up warnings is because there is a, uh, a tort principle and tort are the lawsuits that are essentially those for uh, you know, wrongs, but they're things that are not based on contract. So if there's a slip and fall or if there's whatever, uh, those are what we call tort lawsuits. And you have uh, either a du- you have one of two duties, you know, to make safe or to disclose. And so, as long as you disclose, and uh, it, and it's a reasonable disclosure, uh, something that people passing into the facility would see, you pr- you know, that goes a long way to meeting your b- burden. Well, you know, is there a 100% perfect way to protect you? Absolutely not. But uh, a a warning sign can be very effective. If you you, you had some signage that, you know, says, use electronic surveillance on this property, um, and you you are seeing inside the space they rent, yeah, you know that's one of the what, what that was one of the things that's come up in the world of video is where what do the video cameras see, and uh, and and uh, you you actually bring up an interesting point because clearly a, a person a, a business has a right to. Uh, you know, basically view its own premises and take those steps that it deems necessary to keep it more secure. Uh, you know, and not quite the one you're talking about, but what if your video uh, surveillance uh, strays to the property next door or the uh, interior of the space? I don't think the interior... Yeah, I, you know, no, I know, but uh, there's actually been litigation on the other one. I don't think they interior the space because I think that um, it, it sort of goes with the warning that there's surveillance on the, uh, you know, within the premises. And if you're if you're um, doing surveillance of drives or things like that, uh, open spaces are going to come with, you know, it's very likely that an open space will come within the view. I, I just don't see that as a huge exposure. I, you know, I think if you have a, you know, I, I think you will have a problem if a person who uh, actually monitors those cameras <laughs> is breaking into great spaces. But th- you know, th- that that's why you, uh, you know, that's why you have insurance <laughs> because you're, you know, the human factor can't be taken out of these things. That's it. So, Carlos, um, in my article that you referenced, I talked about having an introductory rate addendum or something yeah. to that effect. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I um, I think that um, be, uh, if it is an introductory rate or a promotional rate or something of that nature, you want a tenant to uh, have the terms and conditions. And so if you're, wherever it's advertised, so if you've got a promotional rate or an introductory rate online, uh, you know, state the terms and conditions quite clearly. I just, you know, I just did one for an operator that uh, had a, a 90-day rate, and I said, well, you know, it, it's not that hard. Just tell people when it, you know, that you're uh, that that it's for 90 days, and thereafter you can increase rent on 30 days' notice. And uh, that was, pr- you know, that was pretty much the disclosure that we made. But I like making sure that all uh, promotions and introductory pricing and things like that, that the tenant gets a, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically gets the terms and conditions. Uh, again, this is not really, in my mind, where you have to go uh, through the, uh, the the steps of forming a separate agreement or something like that. It's just that you want something out there so that there there may not be confusion as to what the tenant is actually entering into. Any other questions for Carlos? Yeah. So awesome. So oh, Travis, did you already? Did you already? Uh, I walked in later. So, did you already uh, attack or approach the what, what 
public storage and what extra space is doing with this if you look them up on the internet right now we're all aware of this room right now that's two hundred dollars with a red line through it and it says one hundred and what they're doing is they're basically killing the rates in the market and and so do you see any repercussion as a result of that Carlos uh, well we thought we talked about that a bit yeah. and is this it? Yeah, I mean, it's in that almost every market that they're in. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I think that if you look at the ba the bottom one, I think there is a possibility that the, uh, the you know, that the plaintiff's bar might take some action in something like that if they see an attractive class action opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, you know, but you do have to come back to the fundamental rule of commercial real estate, and that's that. Uh, if you if you rent something on a month to month basis, the uh, the owner can raise the rent, uh, you know, with a fairly short notice. And uh, you know, our question, the one question that I think we've kicked around a bit is, if you go into the transaction knowing that within sixty, you know, thirty, sixty, ninety days, you're going to send out a rent increase, is that a problem? Do you have do you have uh, a, 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 is there a requirement that you disclose? And yeah, I, I, would be, I think, would be. and you might, but uh, you know, the, it, it, again, it, it's real estate. And you never really know. Yeah. Uh, I think if you got it to a jury, uh, it wouldn't be good. I think if, uh, but uh, I think they one of the strategies, especially with the REITs now, is that they probably don't think that a case like this would actually get to a jury because they have arbitration provisions in their contracts. They have, um, you know, I mean, they write things up pretty well, and so it may never go. It may never go to trial. So if somebody brought a class, it would probably get settled. In well, if you read their man, if you read the mandatory arbitration provisions that are being that are out there now, uh, uh, we uh, people, you know, businesses aren't that keen on arbitration. What they like is that you can have arbitration with a class action waiver, and what that does is it basically f uh, forecloses the right uh, for the, that named uh, plaintiff. To be, uh, he has to go to arbit. He or she has to go to arbitration. They can't bring a, uh, a a representative action. And if you eliminate the class action threat, then that threat at the bottom probably isn't that strong. I think there might be a fir uh, you know a law firm that do it that they might try to argue that no, we're not suing. We're suing under statute, and the statute itself gives us a right to go to court. That's met with mixed results. Uh, with you know with the, the the current Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, loves arbitration and, and has consistently enforced these provisions in the consumer context.